Greetings, my name is Liz Ferguson and I'll be talking to you in this presentation about marine algae and plants. There is a diversity of plants and algae which we can classify into one of three groups. First is the microalgae. This group of organisms belong to the kingdom Protista and oftentimes I should mention that algae and plants are sometimes thought of uh, as being in the same group. However, they are quite different, and algae belong to a kingdom called Protista, so it's a completely separate domain from plants. They are largely, or they're going to consist of single-celled eukaryotic uh, organisms, so they are eukaryotes and not prokaryotes, which means they'll have um, chloroplasts and a series of other organelles that are not present within a prokaryote, things like that. And just to give you an idea, a couple examples of these microalgae. Um, are the coccolithosphore, the dinoflagellate, and the diatom pictured here. So very small organisms, but very powerful in terms of their, their primary productive capabilities um, and their ability to kind of overwhelm an ecosystem through harmful algal blooms and things along those lines. Next we have a category of macroalgae. This, again, is going to consist of organisms that belong to the kingdom Protista. However, these are going to be multicellular eukaryotic organisms. As you can see in these images of green algae, red algae, and brown algae, um, and these particular organisms can also, uh, particular the red algae, and uh, I believe the green algae can have some single-celled organisms that belong to it, but by and large they're going to come consist of multicellular organisms. Um, these are going to be what we kind of think of in terms of algae. They're going to be uh, colorful and that color is going to be due to the pigment, the photosynthesizing pigment that's prevalent within these organisms. Finally we have true plants which are going to be organisms that belong to the kingdom plantae. They are multicellular eukaryotic organisms and if you were to kind of take this group and differentiate further, um, we find that there are four different subgroups of plants. They can belong to a group called um, uh, a group called um, mosses, uh, another group of ferns, a group of conifers, and flowering plants. So these organisms are all going to be what we think of in terms of terrestrial plants, and we're not going to delve into all of these characteristics of terrestrial plants, but uh, they are going to, marine plants are going to have characteristics of these terrestrial plants because, of course, they are found on land just at the part of the land that intersects with the sea. So they're going to have some special adaptations to deal with that. Seagrasses, we'll start with those. Seagrasses are part of the angiosperm group. They belong to a specific group called monocots which has to do with, um, there's monocots and dicots, it has to do with characteristics of the stem, of the, um, of the seed, and things along those lines. They are going to secrete salt through the leaves and stem. They can grow rapidly and are very good in terms of their provision of food and habitat for other organisms. Uh, we find, find these in shallow waters of bays and estuaries. And just as a good example, eelgrass is something that is widely distributed and uh, people can recognize it from this picture here as it's, as it's quite prevalent within a lot of marine ecosystems close to the shore. Within the rocky intertidal zone of San Diego County, as an example of um, some other types of grasses, sea grasses, uh, at low tide, we have this emerald green meadows of surf grass. So you see this variety in grasses that occur in different regions along the coast, both just under the subtidal region and in the intertidal region. The structure of these plants are going to be different from the structure of algae. Um, the Plants are going to have a leaf, which is adapted to minimize water loss. They have a root, which is modified for different marine habitats. So the root might be a little bit more shallow, uh, exposed to the water and things along those lines. They have a rhizome, which is an underground stem to help give them a bit of 
um, security in, in helping them not to kind of float away in the ocean currents. And then they're going to have a flower structure to them, which is going to be the reproductive organ. As you can see in this example of the eelgrass over on the right hand side there, uh, there's a small little flower that uh, is, is found in, on one of the leaves. Seagrass reproduction is quite unique. In this example of the flowering surf grass off to the left hand side, um, probably don't even notice it because those flowers are very small and inconspicuous. The pollen, which you know we're very familiar with pollen on terrestrial plants, terrestrial flowers, uh, but the pollen, which is equivalent to the sperm, is carried by water currents. And the tiny seeds are going to be carried by currents as well as animal species. So only flowering plants that can be totally submerged are going to be successful in reproduction. This gives you an idea of what uh, a different difference between a flowering surf grass on the right hand side and a non-flowering surf grass on the left hand side. So um, very subtle kind of differences in those structures. There are some requirements to be able to survive in a marine habitat. First is that they must be adapted to a saline water environment. Secondly, they must grow while submerged. So being at the surface should not be a requirement for growth for these organisms. They have to be anchored with a hold fast in order to withstand wave action and, and uh, currents. And actually that's more a rhizome and not necessarily a hold fast. Hold fast is more attributable to algae. So um, by hold fast, I mean just things that attach them um, securely to a structure. And then they also have to be able to engage in water pollination. In San Diego, we have uh, five native species to the rocky shores in sandy or muddy bays, including the flowering surf grass and eel grass, which I mentioned is prevalent, and a few other species. Um, there are four that live submersed in brackish water of the salt marshes uh, and in estuaries, and those include these species, such as the rupia, the uh, nandus marina, and a um, couple others. Salt marshes and mangroves are also going to have some unique species of marine plants. In salt marshes, the habitat is going to be a wetland that's dominated by what we call herbaceous rather than woody plant species. And within a mangrove, the habitat is a coastal wetland that's found in the tropics and in subtropic regions. And these plants are going to be characterized uh, by the fact that they are halophilic, I'm sorry, halophytic, which means they're salt-loving trees. Um, they tend to consist of shrubs and other plants that grow in brackish to saline tidal waters and usually along the edge. So they will have a root structure that is submerged as well. Um, here's just a couple examples, the pickleweed and saltgrass and cattail that of, of plants that are found in San Diego marshes. This saltwater, um, or sorry, salt marsh daughter, which is in the lower right-hand corner, uh, is actually quite prevalent in San Diego as well. There's three nat native species. And they, it's actually a parasite to the plant, so it'll grow on some of these other native plants and eventually block its, its ability to photosynthesize, so block its access to the sun. So quite a gnarly one you've maybe seen while you're out hiking in the region, if you're in San Diego. So adaptations. We see a couple different varieties in terms of the adaptations of algae versus plants. Uh, first, Algae can be unicellular or multicellular, whereas only pl plants can only be multicellular organisms. Um, algae are predominantly underwater, whereas plants are predominantly on land. Um, algae are always non-vascular, whereas uh, plants are predominantly vascular. By that, we mean there's a series of, of structures that within which um, there can be transportation of water as well as sugars and other nutrients up the stems and to the leaves of the plant. So you don't find that vascular system ever in algae. In plants, you find it in all groups with the exception of mosses. So if we are to take a look at some of the structures of an algae versus seagrass here, 
over on the left hand side you see this hold fast I, I kind of had that incorrectly labeled in my plants the plants are going to have this rhizome as well as roots they're not going to have this specific hold fast but they do hold fast to structures through the rhizomes and the roots there uh, but in the algae we're going to have something that looks structurally similar to those structures in the plants such as the seagrass this stipe here is equivalent to the little bit of a stem that occurs here the blade is going to be equivalent to some of the leaves of the seagrass and these seagrasses are going to have these little flowers which are not going to be um, prevalent on the algae. Now there are some differences between algae versus seaweed. Algae are going to be defined as chlorophyll containing organisms that are commonly found in aquatic environments uh, but they are going to largely be unicellular. There are some that are multicellular and they grow in environments such as marine bodies in the sea and even freshwater bodies whereas seaweed is going to be a plant-like organism that attaches itself to rocks and other hard substrate substances. Um, they're always going to be multicellular and they're only found in the sea. The other thing about algae is that they can grow in both deep and shallow water whereas seaweed can only grow in shallow water because in order to get to that larger size, that multicellular structure requires a, lighter, a, a larger amount of exposure to the sun. Uh, reproduction is an important element to understand for these organisms. Uh, plants and algae undergo something called the alternation of generations, which is the alternation between two distinct forms of these different uh, stages of genetic composition. We have a form called the haploid, which consists of a stage where there's only half the genetic material present, and a diploid stage, which is where we have um, both sets or a combined set of genetic information or a full set. Um, as I mentioned, both of these organisms are going to go through these different stages, but they're going to exist in those different forms for different periods of times. Just by comparison with humans, they actually have, uh, as you can imagine, we're the only time where we're having half the genetic information present in a cell is when the cells are in both the egg and the sperm form. So once, as soon as those cells combine and fertilize, then they form a zygote where we're going to have the diploid stage, which is a full set of genetic information. So these organisms actually, organisms actually manifest into a structure during those two stages. So it would be as if our egg and our sperm were to turn into some structure that could exist outside of our body, <laughs> um, which obviously would be quite, quite crazy. Um, the alternation of generation can be kind of displayed in this figure, wherein you have the gametophyte stage represented at the top, which is where there's only half the genetic information, and the sporophyte generation located at the bottom, which has the full complement of genetic material. Um, the fertilization happens uh, when those two gametes, a female gamete and a male gamete, are going to combine together and fertilize. Um, and then a process of mitosis and cell division is going to result in a structure which is going to produce spores through the process of meiosis. And then those spores will grow into a structure which are going to then um, combine in some way. So for our algae, it's an example of that cycle, um, there's actually some asexual reproduction that can occur in these organisms. Um, so there is kind of a spinoff of that which is not going to involve um, the kind of fusion or fertilization happening. Um, as you can imagine, if you're, if you're in a region where there's not a lot of other algae, then it's going to be beneficial to be able to reproduce asexually or without the fertilization from a separate plant. So in the cycle to the right, or sorry, in the section to the left, we have a letter A, which is representing that asexual reproduction process. Uh, from the diploid plant, from the organism or the structure that has the full complement of genetic material. If they do happen to undergo meiosis and produce these gametes, then the, the gametes or the haploid structures are going to um, have both a male and a female version. Uh, for algae, we have these cute little cellular structures that are kind of just floating around. Um, once those combine and fertilize into this zygote, they undergo that process of mitosis and develop into that, for instance, that um, 
algae or that seaweed structure that we're used to seeing. So the haploid stage, the gamete stage, is something that we're not quite as familiar with. You probably would not be able to recognize it as a seaweed in particular, in this particular example, um, until it gets to that diploid stage where it has a completely different physical manifestation or physical structure. Plants undergo something similar in terms of, the, with respect to the fact that they have this stage of um, a gametophyte stage and a sporophyte stage. However, in something like flowering plants, such as our seagrasses, that sporophyte stage is still going to manifest and create a structure that is either female or male and are separate from one another. However, it's gonna be housed on this flower uh, as opposed to being kind of a free floating, free floating as with the algae in the, gam the gamete stage or the haploid stage. Um, this is gonna be kind of anchored to that flower. So in the middle here, we have the female gametophyte or the egg, the ovum, um, whereas the male gametophyte is, gonna con is going to uh, exist within this pollen grain or this pollen stem. Um, they're located on the similar structure in order to allow for uh, self-fertilization in the event that that situation arises and there's no other options available or there's no pollination occurring. Uh, but also this uh, benefits the organism because the pollination from things like pollinators can, or, or from currents carrying pollen uh, makes it a little bit more feasible for that to, um, that uh, like a pollinator to land in the same area on each plant in order to carry the pollen to that stage. You don't have to worry about that as much with water pollination, obviously, because it's just kind of like external fertilization of eggs of fish. They're just going to lay some eggs and shoot out some, some sperm, and hopefully they're going to meet together in order to undergo that fertilization. It's a little bit different with our marine plants. There we go. Uh, finally, just a bit about kelp forests. The kelp forest is a very unique habitat. In California, it's characterized. We have some regions along our coast that, well, that were characterized by dense kelp forests, over the past 20, 30 years or so, that's been kind of devastated by um, various different different um, conditions that have arised, including uh, the great sea star die-off, which resulted in a bunch of urchins feeding on all of these different uh, kelp forests. But kelp forests are characterized by brown algae that, that exists 22 to 30 meters in depth. Uh, they are the, the dominant kelps of the California coast include the giant kelp and the bull kelp. And I'm not gonna play that video that I have a link to in this presentation for this recording, but if you go to a YouTube video called Changing Kelp Forest Environments, it's a really good um, kind of perspective and overview on how kelp forests are changing in uh, along the California coast. So we'll just kind of skip through this, but it's a really good little video to get a better handle on how those kelp forests are changing. Great, well, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and uh, learn more about plants and algae and are able to differentiate between them.